with a critic, which is the other kind of toxic person, sometimes they do have something to offer. Sometimes they do speak truth. You know, sometimes they, they do say things that you need to hear and it's maybe not comfortable. In fact, I remember even in my teenage years, I had mentors who pointed out things that I, I wasn't doing correctly. It was painful to hear, they were critics, but I needed to hear it. And uh, I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that sometimes a critic is valuable. They're just not a great communicator. You are now listening to the Going North Podcast with your host, author and speaker, Dom Bregman. And every Monday and Thursday, you're going to hear the voice of a different author share their stories, expertise, and their struggles that they had to overcome in life to leave you inspired to get more out of your life. Be sure to not only listen to this episode, but share with others, connect with the authors, and always advance others to advance yourself. Now let's get on with the show. And today on the Going North podcast, we bring you some fabulous humans from across the globe. Today is no different. Today is no different. Eh, who, who am I kidding? It's a different day with a different author. And this author, my goodness, this author right here, over the last two decades, this guy right here has conducted extensive firsthand research into the lives of the world's top achievers, and he has success strategies of the top business leaders from companies like Nike, Reebok, Fruit of the Loom, FedEx, KFC, United Airlines, Microsoft, Disney, and others to share so my man's got sprinkles of them baby abc television and fox business refer to this guest right here as the modern day napoleon hill and this guy right here is author three books in the guerrilla marketing series and is the creator of entrepreneur of influence which is the top or should i say one of the top business training programs in the world providing powerful tools to companies individuals and students so let's give it up for mr dv himself mr doug vermeer and how you doing today sir i am doing awesome thank you so much for having me you're awesome yourself that's great (laughs) ah yes indeed yes indeed gotta have a a in there to make awesome somehow (laughs) there you go there you go (laughs) yes indeed and speaking of awesome we got this new super special awesome movie that's out and making some noise in the digital space since folks are Still mostly trapped indoors. Isn't it true? Isn't it true? Yeah, you know, I think it's actually very timely that this movie's come out. In fact, uh, I've even had people ask me, did I plan the COVID virus to be able to release it at this time? But we did not, right? It was coincidence. But I'll tell you, I do feel very thankful that we can provide some hope because as I've been chatting with people around the world, there's a lot of people that are not only stuck indoors, which is tough, sometimes even being stuck with people they don't like, which is even tougher, um, but really the challenge is too, as many people are having struggles financially right now, right? They're not sure where things are gonna wind up or what they're gonna do. And so uh, we're very grateful that this film has been able to provide hope to people and help them to really kind of see that their thoughts are more within their control than they possibly had realized before. And it's so darn true, especially now where a lot of folks are, they may be slowly trickling back outside, some of the folks, but there's still some folks like, nope, I'm in the house, and it's like they got to do some thinking, and it's like, okay, let let me make sure they actually think on something that's actually good and making sure it's something that'll benefit me and those around me. Yeah, yeah, well, it's interesting, because as you're saying, like, I mean, right now, I think the, it seems like the world is almost ready to restart, right? Like, people are almost ready to get back to things. But there is still a lot of fear here, right? Like, there's still a lot of people wondering, you know, is it safe to go out? And uh, where, what am I going to do for income? How can I restart things and everything else? And so, you know, the truth is that everything does come from our thoughts. Our thoughts ignite everything. But the thing that, you know, I find remarkable is people don't really understand the how, right? So what is it that really makes these thoughts manifest? What is it, you know, because, you know, it's not just the negative thoughts, it's not just the positive thoughts, but how do we distill the thought that we really want to turn into something? And uh, that's what this this film is going to answer, right? Like, how do you sort through these and find out what's going to serve you best and help you to reach your greatest self, your best potential, right? So it's 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 a really neat experience. It's a really neat journey that we've got. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, it's exciting to have these guys back. In fact, all of them have done movies for me before. 
funny enough, John Martini is one of my best friends and he's actually been in all four of my movies thus far. So uh, just a little bit of trivia there. But yeah, there, it, you know, it's interesting because although we've had this discussion before, we've talked about it in The Secret, we've talked about it in my other movies, there's always been a level of things that we haven't been able to discuss. And as you can imagine, you know, my biggest and hardest job with all of this making these movies, I get a chance to, to really spend a lot of time with these people. I get a chance to go into detail on a lot of deep concepts. And then I have to actually make a decision of what I'll leave out, right? What will <laughs> I not cover? And, and that's such a hard thing. And so this time we decided to do something a little different with the movie. I did include a lot of the really powerful stuff, everything that I thought people needed to know, but we also created a workbook and some other activities to go alongside the movie. So hopefully this gives people the deepest experience yet out of any of the films that you've seen. And um, the other thing that I think is kind of important too that I always recommend is that, you know, your thoughts really follow the things that you allow to influence you, meaning, you know, the TV you watch, the radio you watch the, or listen to, the social media that you participate in, but also the people you hang out with. So one of the things I recommend is don't watch this movie alone. And when you're done the movie, discuss it. Right? Find some people that you guys can talk through some of the ideas and you'll find you'll get a lot more out of it than simply watching it by yourself. There you go. There you go. And funny enough, you alluded to one of my favorite points that I had to actually take notes from the movie is the fact that a lot of folks tend to tell you avoid toxic people, but in the movie actually suggest instead of avoiding them, just better managing them. Yeah. In fact, that's interesting. Um, when I interviewed the world's top achievers, kind of like you alluded to at the beginning, uh, I got to like 400 of them. And the thing that was interesting is when you start interviewing 400 of the most successful people on the planet, you start seeing patterns emerge, right? Like it gets pretty clear what they do. And I noticed very quickly that there's a lot of things that a lot of the gurus of today do teach that's just not correct, that doesn't work. And the biggest thing we hear is avoid toxic people or sever them from your life. And now I get it, if someone's abusive, yes, you do need to depart. But oftentimes people do label those that are toxic um, incorrectly. You know, somebody just disagrees with you, they're toxic and you cut them off, right? And that's not how top achievers work. In fact, they don't run from problems, they learn how to manage problems and that's how we expand who we are. And if you wanna expand what you have, you have to expand who you are, which means you expand your ability to handle uh, problems, which includes sometimes people. And the other thing that I think was kind of neat, I don't know if you remember I mentioned in the film, is generally when we talk about toxic people, there are two kinds. So there are complainers that, you know, they just complain and they don't really have anything to offer and there's no solution. They just complain, blah, 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 right? And, um, and, and for those kind of guys, there's really nothing they have that they value or to offer a value, right? Like there's nothing valuable that they bring. But with a critic, which is the other kind of toxic person, Sometimes they do have something to offer. Sometimes they do speak truth. You know, sometimes they, they do say things that you need to hear and it's maybe not comfortable. In fact, I remember even in my teenage years, I had mentors who pointed out things that I, I wasn't doing correctly. It was painful to hear, they were critics, but I needed to hear it. And uh, I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that sometimes a critic is valuable. They're just not a great communicator meaning that they don't know how to say things in a way that you're gonna feel good about it, but you certainly still need to hear it. And so I think that it's important that we look very carefully at what we, how should we say, what we label that feedback to be, that we don't just you know, say, oh, they're toxic, uh, you know, irrelevant, not for me, not important. Well, it might be, right? It really might be, and it, it might be important for you to, to hear that. It might, you might be on the verge of finding out something about yourself that really could make a difference for your future. Amen to that. Amen to that. And it's so true because there's some critics out there who may try to give the quote unquote hate to people, but then there's the true critics where it's like they're really trying to give you advice that's critical to your success. Well, that's exactly right. You know, and you know, one of the things that I do think is important now, sometimes people ask me, you know, how do your thoughts really become things? And they also ask me about what's the biggest thing that I learned when I interviewed the 400 of the world's top achievers. And I think the biggest thing to, to really see in my own life for sure is that our thoughts also follow the influences around us. It's not just an eternal thing and like internal, it's also that you know, our thoughts follow a lot of the things that stimulate those thoughts. Now, you've heard the saying that says that we become like the five people we spend the most time with. And I have totally found that true. 
as a 19 year old, you know, at first I was hanging out with people that were other 19 year olds. They didn't have great ambition. They believed that, you know, you exchange time for money you get stuck in the rat race. You try and get a good education and you grind your way out. But the more time that I spent with the top achievers and started learning from them, I realized that truthfully money is not attached to time. Money is attached to systems. And money also doesn't necessarily care how educated you are as long as you're using the systems. And I also found that as I hung up with these people that think bigger, they saw possibilities and they were possibility thinkers. And so that kind of, I guess, environment, if you will, stimulated me. One of the things that I think is maybe also kind of cool to point out is that you've heard that your net work equals or determines your net worth. Well, everybody always says that's about money and money is a result. It's not really the foundation. So when I think of that, your net work determines your net worth, I take that word worth and I really kind of interpret it this way, right? Like worth is what does somebody find valuable, right? What is a worth? And so truly your net work determines your values, right? And so if you hang out with somebody who's got a value on creativity, imagination, problem solving, facing challenges, rising bigger, and living a higher life, that's what we're going to see as an outcome. But if we, of course, hang out with people who have low values for those things, we're going to gravitate to that. And so those that we hang out with are actually the standards that we have. And so I think it's really important that we recognize that one of the biggest things you can do to level up your thoughts is change those that you're receiving benefits from. Uh, yes. It's kind of like we have these old, comfortable shoes that need shoe polish. And it's like you're putting shoe polish on them and making them shine once again. Because that's really... So powerful, the fact that you mentioned, like, it's like, yeah, the, the classic saying sure is like, hey, the five friends you have, the ones you hang around, they're really where your future's going, but also they're your foundation <laughs> in a way. <laughs> you got it. That's right. Yes, indeed. And that's really something that people probably really don't even truly think about because a lot of the thing about cliches is that they become cliches because they're so darn true and is that the, e the advice is so easy to follow that it's so easy not to follow <laughs> well I, I think you're right and here's the deal is sometimes people hear these things so often that they think that they've already got that figured out they don't think about what that really means in detail or in depth especially that idea of you become like the five people you hang around with that's a golden key it really is but everybody's thinking yeah you're right i go to hang out with better people and then what do they do they go right back to where they were one of the things that one one of my mentors said to me you know when i was first doing the interviews with the top achievers that really changed my perspective. He said, you'll never do a million dollar deal at a $10 breakfast. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we think about that as a networking experience, right? That the big deals are not at the cheap, low end networking. And that might be one way to interpret it, but I think that that's with everything in life. If you want to level up, you can't hang around, pardon the expression, with losers. And I'm not saying that the people that you're with are losers and have no value, right? Somebody's going to write in now to your show and tell that, tell me that Doug Vermeer guy is, you know, a jerk, right? Because I use that word losers, but I'm going to say that you need to hang out with people that are going to bring out the best in you most of the time. There are people that, you know, you should hang out with who are, you know, obviously maybe on a lower level than where you want to be. That's fine, you know, but you should be limiting your time with them and you should be really looking to spend time with people that are going to lift you higher, that are going to inspire you, that are going to validate you, that are going to have you feel like you're in your brilliance. And one of my favorite interviews that I did was with a fellow by the name of Bill Bartman. And Bill started on welfare, but he became the 25th wealthiest man in the United States. And by the way, he is in our first film, The Opus. And one of the things that Bill told me, which I thought was just brilliant, he said, if I'm the smartest guy in the room, I'm in the wrong room right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we got to really find a way to, to find, and, and again, I, 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 I'm apprehensive to use that word losers, but I'm not really sure how to describe it. And I don't mean it in a derogatory way. I just mean it's maybe people who are satisfied where they're at, right? Um, maybe that's, you know, maybe not a loser, but it, it's someone who's kind of holding back from their best. They don't really realize that there's bigger for them and they're satisfied where they are and, and, and that's fine. And I think that's a very dangerous place to be. And if we hang around with people who are just you know, satisfied to coast, satisfied to take the easy route or to take the, you know, path of least resistance. Well, that always leads to a, a life of unfulfillment, a, a life of despair, discouragement, and, and it's something that doesn't work. Like Socrates once said, you know, the Greek philosopher, he said that we are teleological beings, which means that we find our happiness in making progress. 
If you wonder, you know, what can I do to become more happy? Well, the truth is, is you're not doing enough to reach your potential because we're in the process, wherever we're in the process of progression, we find power and that's important. And if you're feeling right now, especially in the COVID that you're discouraged and you're stuck, it's because you're really not pushing yourself in a way that's improving you right now. And the fastest way to really feel good about yourself is to do something that leads you towards your greater self. So I would encourage you that. There's a challenge that I'm just going to drop for you right there, whoever's listening, right? Ah, there you go. There you go. We all need to be challenged too, no matter (laughs) what level we're on. And it's really fabulous that you're able to get around so many successful people and actually take and actually implement the advice you got from them. Well, it it was a blessing. It really was a blessing. And, um, you know, a lot of people have asked me uh, again about how I learned these things from these people. And, you know, the truth is, is it was sort of a, a line upon line kind of thing, you know? So my first success interviews that I did certainly gave me a foundation, but there's a lot different questions that I'm asking now, right? Like I've expanded and I've grown too. And, and I think if there's one important lesson that we all can learn from, you know, the top achievers in the world, you know, whether it's my interviews with them or just the way they conduct themselves is you must be curious. You must become a lifelong learner. You must understand that uh, while you're you know, uh, learning that that's where your growth is and, and learning means you need to change. In fact, I've been telling, um, you know, some of the speakers and you might remember this in the film, but some of the speakers from the film, I said, the important words here are not thoughts and things Our things always exist, right? Things are always around you. You want a Ferrari? It exists already, right? Your thoughts are not necessarily going to create it. It already exists. And your thoughts again are always there, right? Whether they're positive, they're negative, they're neutral, they're you know, happy, they're enthusiastic, whatever it is, your thoughts are always there. But the two other words, how and become are important. So how are you going to stabilize the thoughts to attract the things that you want? And maybe most importantly, that word become, how are you going to change? How are you going to change yourself to become the individual that can accept those things that you want? In fact, Jim Rohn once said, and I thought this was brilliant. He says, if you win the lottery, you're going to have to learn how to become a millionaire really fast because the truth is is when we're given something or an opportunity unless we're really willing to change and to step into that new opportunity to become something new whatever arrives we're not going to be able to maintain it and so i you know it's kind of my hope that people understand you've you've heard that saying that said you know you've got to be it before you can do it before you can have it you know most people are looking right now for what do i need to do and they're also saying how can i have it but they're not really looking at the who they need to become. And that's where the complete difference, that's where the real change in the shift take place. I forgot who it was. I'm not sure if it was you or someone else where in the movie where it talked about, are you willing to connect on the inside and direct your focus on what you want on the outside? And that's so true because it's like, you know what? You're so right. I mean, you, a Ferrari, if that's what you want, it's already there. <laughs> it's like, you got to actually connect on, from within and actually do the true yeah yeah so yeah. for those who oh sorry go ahead just one thought on the ferrari too speaking as as a ferrari owner uh they often say ferraris and things like that are like boats right the happiest day is the day you buy it and, ha- and the second happiest day is the day you sell it so don't think that, <laughs> that that's going to be your end all be all of happiness too because i think the important thing is for most people also with this idea of what they want they don't really take the time to consider if it's going to make them happy or not, right? And I love what Stephen Covey said in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He said that most people climb the ladder of success only to find that it's leaning against the wrong wall. And so I think it's important that before you decide what it is that you want, you know, one of the things that that we teach our students is that happiness is not a choice. You've heard before, happiness is a choice. Well, that's actually half the equation. Happiness is a choice, but it's also being very excited at peace and in harmony with the consequences that follow from those choices. Immediate gratification never creates lasting happiness. But when you make a choice based on something that you do want long-term and the consequences arrive in a manner that's pleasing to you, that's happiness. And so I think we just need to recognize that um, it's not just the having, it's the enjoying what you have that makes the difference. Oh, yes, indeed. Wise words spoken by sages (laughs) because it's so... True, because I I never did understand the allure of the whole sports car thing, because that's the thing I keep hearing so much from those who've actually owned. It's like, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, it's, it's nice to have for pictures and everything and driving it, but you got to keep up with it. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I do love owning a car like that, but I love it for different reasons. And um, for those that follow me on social media, you see that I rarely post pictures of things like that. And if that's why you get them, you're not really getting them for you anyways. You're getting them for other people to admire you. It's an ego thing. It's not really an authentic thing. Uh, we could really get into a deep conversation on that. Maybe we will another day. But the truth is, is the things that fulfill you are generally not the things that you post uh, photographs of to get likes. Like your motive will not be to seek approval outside yourself for the things that really do make you happy. They make you happy regardless of what people say. And so I think it's important also when we're looking at, you know, our motives and things like when we do things, like I said, for immediate gratification or to please others, we can generally count on that they will not give us lasting satisfaction. We need to find that authentic value, if you will. And when we do that, we can start creating things that will keep us happy independently of the opinion of others. And that's actually what true happiness, I believe, is. It has nothing to do with other people when it's authentic to us. There you go. And for those who want to truly be authentic and come from a true place of authenticity, what's probably the advice you would give to them from your experience? Well, you know, it's interesting because as we talk about it in the film, we kind of use the words authenticity and harmony when we talk about programming. In other words, the programming that's happened to you as an individual. And many people, they look at programming and they think, oh, okay, so since the day I was born, I've been programmed. What my family's taught to me, what, you know, my community's taught to me, what I've seen on TV, the beliefs that I've had, the values that I had, that's all the programming. But the truth is, is you're even being programmed now, even as you listen to this show. The information that you're taking in is becoming part of your program. And so I think we need to understand that when it comes to being authentic, we need to start taking control of our own programming. And how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to become aware of what our programming is creating, not only in, in terms of the limitations, because we also talk about that too often, I think, as people. I, I can't do it because my belief systems limit me, this, that, and the other. But the truth is, is your programming also gives you power, right? When you're, like we said in the beginning, hanging out with good people, bringing in great influences, that's a form of programming too. And it gives you the thoughts and the beliefs that you can and that you will and that you are destined to succeed. Now, once we have that awareness, the next power that we need to activate is what I call the power of choice. When we start seeing that we have choices to do new things, we can take new paths. And every choice that we understand that we have, it gives us more power. Now, I'm not saying that we have to take all the choices that appear to us, but just the fact that we see more expanded ability, the ability to do more, to make new choices and everything, that's power. And I think, um, you know, the thing that our goal in life should be, and this is also part of happiness, is we always want to be making decisions that lead us to have more choices, right? A couple of years ago, I got a chance to speak in the uh, maximum security prison at North Carolina. And it was very interesting to be in that prison and talk to people who, you know, at the time when they, they were making their mistake that got them in jail, they thought they were making a pretty good choice. But obviously that choice led to more confinement, more constriction, more rules and regulations around them, and it began to limit their freedom. And that's not really a happy place to be. And so we need to think maybe, you know, the opposite of that would be to make choices that will give us more freedom, more possibility, more uh, a grander view of the world, the, the opportunity to participate in the things that are going to help us reach our maximum brilliance and our full potential. And so we need to really carefully consider how these choices that we make will affect us. And so when it comes to authenticity, the key is authenticity is all about really making choices that allow us to find our greatest self. That's really what it is. That's true. That's something that a lot of folks desire at one point. I want to see everybody, but <laughs> we both know that's not true. <laughs> it would be awesome if it was, but the truth is everyone, like we're even talking about choice, everyone has to make that choice. And, and the truth is, I think it's fair to say that in some cases, you know, reaching our freedom is uh, almost like a step in the dark for some people. It's, it's, a, it's a leap of faith. It, it's taken them to a place that they've never been. And in order for us to you know, let go of our old programming, it's almost like climbing a ladder, right? You can't get to the next rung on the ladder unless you let go of the rung you're on. And you know, many people just aren't willing to do that. There's too much uh, security in their mind. There's too much of a foundation that they've already built. They think they've maybe invested too much effort or time. And for them to try something new at this point in their life, it's, 
in their mind, just too risky because their programming has told them that they're going to be losing everything or possibly losing everything if they try to gain, right? If they try to become their truest self, there's too much to lose. And uh, I guess my experience has been that, um, quite frankly, you're already in a losing position by hanging on to a lower rung on the ladder because it's kind of like that analogy that a lot of people have used before. It's like running up an escalator the wrong way. It's always moving against us. Change is propelling everything around you forward. Things around you are changing daily. And, you know, I mean, everything, right? Technology, people, relationships, everything. The world is changing. And if you choose to stay the same, you're automatically going backwards. And so you need to find a way, in my opinion, to technically reinvent yourself every minute of every day. Ah, I love that. I love that. Because that's something that is very powerful to do, to be able to reinvent yourself, especially every minute, every day. And that even, I guess that kind of goes in line with what I love about this movie and this topic in, in particular is the fact that it's all, it's all good to make sure that you think well, but also decide to take the action to actually make those things a reality. Yeah, and, and you and I, before we got on the call, we talked a little bit about action. And I, I honestly don't think action is spoken of enough nowadays. I think many people think it's going to be somebody else's job or, you know, if I think about it, things will be fine. And action is such a big, important part. In fact, I'm a firm believer that even decision, decisions aren't decisions unless they have an action attached. You must have an action attached. And the more firmly that you bring action uh, into what you're doing, uh, you're not always going to get it right. That's fine. But the objective here is not perfection. In fact, one of the things that I said in our first movie that I thought was important to, to reiterate again is that top achievers are never perfectionists. They're never perfectionists. They're improvisers. And what improvisation means is that you need to take some action to be able to see where your course is going, right? Like if you look even at professional sports, who's really making the most progress? The spectators in the stand or the people in the field playing the game? Well, if you're just a spectator and you're watching life goes by, there's not going to be a lot of great things that develop for you. In fact, your life will go by and the only thing that will really develop is regrets. And so we need to understand that we've only really got, let's call it one inning to play, one you know, session that we've got on the field. One, you, you fill in the blank. You're only here once. This is not a dress rehearsal. And when it's done, it's done. And so I'm going to suggest that we all strive to create the legacy that we were here to do. We've got to get out there. We've got to play. We've got to give it our best. And we've got to listen to really that inner intuition of our heart to understand what it is we're here to do. Because some of us, right, we're, some of us, I'll be honest with you, we're too busy trying to copy what somebody else is doing. And that's never going to provide us satisfaction either because, you know, you'll never be a better version of someone else trying to play their game, right? But you can be a really good version of you doing your game. And uh, if you take the time to figure that out, you know, you're going you're gonna to be very happy about it, regardless of what the results turn out to be. Amen to that. And since we got a lot of folks starting podcasts nowadays, and you interviewed over 400 of the most successful people on the planet, what's probably some advice you'd give to those who like to interview people to become a better interviewer? Well, the first thing is, is don't be concerned about the interview what's been most valuable for me is to actually build a long-term relationship. So you're not just getting a one-time talking with these people. They really become your friends. And, um, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, today I actually had uh, some phone calls with some of the top achievers that I interviewed that I'm still friends with today. So I was on the phone earlier today with Brian Smith, the founder of Odd Boots. I was on the phone today with Barnett Bain, uh, who won an Academy Award for What Dreams May Come, and, and one of our business partners, Michael Binko, who was actually the executive producer of the game show, uh, let's see, he did a few. So what's the millionaire one again then? Oh, who wants to be a millionaire? Uh, who wants to be a millionaire? He did. He did um, A Minute to Win It. He did The Hollywood Game Night Show. He did, right? So like these, these are some pretty big people, but what you want to do is you want to become friends with them so that the relationship lasts longer than the interview. So that's probably number one. And then um, one of the things that, you know, I do a training program on this, how to connect with high level influencers, how to get them to help you. You know, I mean, obviously with this movie, how do you get guys like Bob Proctor to get on board? How do you get guys like, you know, E. Martini and Vitaly and everybody else to support you, right? So it's, it's really about building those relationships, right? And then I think one of the coolest things that I learned when I did the interviews was to really be prepared, right? Don't just wing it. Don't just think, hey, when I get somebody on the phone I'm, or on a Zoom or whatever it is that I'm, I, I can go from there. I've read their bio. We'll let them carry it. No. 
get really prepared because what you'll find is that those top achievers, when you interview them, will actually really respect the um, research that you've done. In fact, I remember one specific uh, interview that I did. This is hilarious. But the gentleman, I said to him on the phone, I said, uh, I'd like to get 15 minutes with you. And so he said, yeah, sure, no problem. And so he's a multi-millionaire multi uh, you know, landowner. And uh, I sat down with him, and he pulled out a stopwatch. He set up on the table. He said, you said 15 minutes, let's go. <laughs> and I was like, what? And so I was like, okay. So I pulled out my questions. I asked him my questions, and I was done inside of 15 minutes. And what was really interesting is at the end, he actually said that was a bit of a test. I wanted to see, number one, if you were prepared. And the fact that you were, I can now give you some of my friends. I will give you to other people and I will recommend you. And then we've become really good friends to this day. And a lot of times now, you know, we have conversations of obviously no stopwatches and some of these, <laughs> but, um, but it's, it's one of those things where, you know, if you're going to play at the high level of top achievers, they want to know that you're serious about who you are, right? They want to know that you have clarity on what you're doing, what your purpose is. And if you have clarity around that, they are going to, you know, they'll find it easy to support you. Right. And so I think that, that that's probably one of the one of the coolest things. And by the way, something interesting that he taught me that I thought was really kind of neat is we were talking later about this 15 minute idea, why he did that, why he chose 15 minutes instead of like an hour, because most people, as you know, you know, you want to meet somebody for a quick meeting. Well, you plan an hour and you go sit at a Starbucks and you chat for an hour. And then at the end of that hour, well, maybe there might be some business done. And then, you know, you book another meeting and well, you slot in another hour. And it was interesting talking with him about this. And uh, he said, you know, that most time that hour comes from how we were trained and programmed when we were in school, right? We were told that you can't learn math or you can't learn social studies or English or whatever it is, unless you dedicate an hour, right? Like that's what the class is. It's an hour. And because of that, it's carried over. And then he pointed out, which was interesting. He said, most of the meetings that we've gone to, the business can get done in 15 minutes if you guys really um, you know, come prepared and get your head down and you train people, write this down, everybody listening, you train people how to treat you, you teach people how to treat you. And so if you tell someone you've got an hour to sit there and gab about BS stuff that doesn't really matter for you or your business and so forth, well, your day is going to be taken away from you, your day will be absorbed. But if you say, listen, we've got 15 minutes, we can do it in person or on the phone, this is what we need to talk about, everybody come prepared, you'd be surprised how much you can get done in a short period of time. And all the top achievers that I that I've spent time with, they are very focused. They know what they want, they know what they want going in, and they also know what they don't want. And they're not prepared to mess around wasting time with things that don't need to be talked about. So you want top top interviews, you need you need to to come prepared. That's what I'm trying to say, I guess. There you go. That's true right there. And what I love about you is that right these past few days even checked on your YouTube channel how I love the fact that you mentioned that you really want to be an influencer, a true influencer to those that matter to you and not try to go for the whole entire planet because it's really tiring and it may not be what you truly need to do because everybody may not be necessary to be a part of your life that may be necessary for a short time. I'm so glad you saw that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm on a bit of a crusade because this word influencer is being thrown around a lot nowadays. And everybody thinks I need to be an influencer and that means I got to have a million subscribers on Instagram or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And that's not really the true definition of, ins of influencer at all. The true definition is, is not to have subscribers. It's to actually be favored, right? Who are you liked by? Not, not the quantity, but I'm talking the quality. And so you want to be you know, ha have a very specific group find you to be the authority, the influencer, and so forth in your marketplace. I'd much rather have, uh, in fact, here, here's a true story. Uh, so I don't have a million subscribers on Instagram. And I don't really care, you know, to have that. Um, but I've got friends that do. I've got uh, one friend that's got about 2 million subscribers on Instagram. And I don't think he knows even, you know, 10% of those people in real life. Well, I was recently at a mastermind in London. He came with me. This is London, UK. I had six people in the room and I kind of did it. I don't know. Maybe this is a bit cocky. Please, nobody feel like I'm being arrogant, but I did it to prove a point. I said, let's see how well you do. You post an offer to your 2 million or whatever it was people. And I'm just going to talk to these six people here. Just six. That's all I'm going to talk about to these people. And I'm going to spend the day with them. You spend as many tweets and whatever you want to do to this 
two million people. And in the end, I think he had made somewhere around fifteen or twenty thousand dollars with his two million people, and that's pretty impressive for a weekend, right? But with my six people, I did two hundred fifty thousand British pounds, which, if you do the equivalent, um, I'm in Canada, so that's roughly half a million dollars with six people wow. versus his ten twenty thousand dollars with two million people. So again, I think it's it's being favored by the right people. It's building those relationships of trust. It's connecting with the right people on a high level. And, and I'm not really worried about the quantity of people that like or subscribe. Uh, it's wonderful to have that. You're all welcome to like and subscribe, please do. But the truth is, is if you get my vibe, you'll become my tribe. And if you don't get my vibe and you don't like me, that's cool too, because there's lots of great teachers out there. There's lots of really wonderful people that maybe you do resonate with. The biggest thing that you should be seeking for, and again, back to this idea of using your time and effort sparingly, remember 15 minutes, you can do a lot. You want to find the people that are going to add the most value to you and that, that don't deliver fluff, that actually really deliver stuff, strategies that you can use, things that you can do, things that will help you get to the next level of where you want to be. Um, again, we're not trying to copycat or parrot or become the mentor, right? We've got to become our own person using the tools from the mentor, but we don't want to become a parrot. There's already one of that person that, you know, destroys authenticity. <laughs> but yeah, you want to find your best self. And, you know, it's so interesting that as I went out and I interviewed those top 400 achievers, and by the way, I don't think anybody on the planet since Napoleon Hill has done that. Um, I've got some really good, uh, you know, clear data on what it takes to become wealthy, to create success, to build business that nobody else on the planet has as far as I'm aware. But the thing that I notice about all of these people, uh, for example, when I was with Frank McGuire, Frank McGuire became like a grandpa to me. He was one of the four founders of FedEx, the former VP of marketing for KFC, American Airlines, aid in the White House under Linda B. Johnson, JFK, and so many things that he'd done. Like he had done amazing things, but never once did he try to make me into him, right? And that's an important thing too, just to recognize that, you know, you need to find uh, not only a mentor who has a good track record of creating things, but you need to recognize, can he help me in what I want to do, right? And will his methods work for me? And it's okay to learn from multiple people. Uh, it's okay, you know, I, I kind of love the idea of what does it take the best, ditch the rest. I think that that's an important thing and you've got to kind of find what works for you. And you should never aim on being a carbon copy of, of a mentor or someone who's teaching you. You should strive to be your best self, but taking the best information wherever you can find it, right? Yes, sir, indeed. Yes, sir, indeed. So coming down the pike here and just got probably about two more questions and have you do a quick promotion at the end. So the next question is, is, is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often when you're doing interviews like this? Oh, my gosh. Ah, I never thought about that. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think for me, it's, you know, having, again, done the interviews with the 400 of the world's top achievers, the thing that is always kind of fun about these interviews, like I love chatting with people like yourself, is because, you know, yes, I kept a journal the whole time that I was meeting with these people. I kept tons of notes. But there are sometimes little things that I forget that I've observed or seen that are even lessons to me. And so sometimes it's it, it's kind of cool to have a question that really I haven't kind of, you know, had like a new question, a, a kind of uh, a unique kind of digging question that gets me to think about my experience because I learned too, right? And um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many things that I guess people could ask. I guess, you know, if we're really looking about like a thought that's coming through my mind right now that, you know, just going through a memory, of course, one, one of my favorite things really has to do with creating abundance and wealth, right? And this isn't just about money. This is everything, right? Like abundance in all areas of your life. And uh, I think that people don't ask enough about that, right? They're afraid about this discussion on money. And I'll never forget that I was standing out front of a hotel with the same gentleman, Frank McGuire. And uh, there was a gentleman, uh, a young boy who was putting our bags into the vehicle for us and stuff. And as this kid was done, he turned to Frank for a tip. And Frank held out a $5 bill, but he didn't let go of it. So this kid had one end of it, he had one end of it, and Frank looked right into this guy's eyes, I'll never forget, and he kind of, like the kid's like weirded out, right? So he says, what's that? And the kid says, a $5 bill? He's like, well, what's it worth? And the kid kind of looked down at the, <laughs> sheepishly at the money, and he says, um, $5? And Frank says, no, 
it all depends on what you do with it next. And then he let him have the money. And so I was like, wow, that was a wow. powerful experience. And so from that, I kind of learned from a money point of view. And Frank later explained to me, he goes, every dollar that you have is a seed. It's a seed. And how you use that dollar will determine if it grows other dollars. And so from there, I began to think about all the things in my life that are abundant. How am I using them? How am I really taking care of them? How am I planting them to be bigger? And that's not just money. Again, that can be everything from your time, from your talents, from the contacts that you have, from the uh, skill sets that you have, from the systems that you have, that like everything, fill in the blank, right? Like how are you using the things that you have right now to the greatest possibility to create more so that you can experience more? And so I think that's one question that I'm not asked enough. And like I said, specifically about money, no one ever talks to me too much about money but it's a conversation we should have. How do we create more freedom through that? How do we create more abundance through that? So yeah, I think that's probably a question that, yeah, who knows, maybe we'll come back on in another time and we'll just have a money chat. We could do that too. That'd be fun. <laughs> Sweet. That'd be good for round two. I'm actually surprised folks don't ask you about that more often. No, they don't. They don't, but uh, wow. it's important. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's important. <laughs> and you have great money advice. So I'm surprised people don't ask about that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, may maybe next time what we'll do is we can even talk about passive income. One of the things that uh, Money Magazine just rated me as the number one passive income coach in the world, but it's not really something I do, right? Like I'm not a money coach. I just happen to be very good at it, but it's not even my fault. It's because I got the 400 of the top achievers, it's 400 of the wealthiest people on the planet showing me what to do. And yeah, I know there's people that write books on investing and things like that and I know there's some great stuff out there by Tony Robbins right now, and I, I really love it. He's done a great job, but investing isn't the only way to make money, and a lot of the answers that are provided in some of the different materials that are out there don't work for everybody, right? But when you get 400 of the world's top achievers who are not necessarily all investors, some of them have made their money in business, some have made it through intellectual property, some have made it in real estate, others have made it in you know, owning and operating a business, right? So I mean, there's lots of ways to make money, so there isn't just one clear path, but depending on what you're doing, um, there's actually some systems that you can put into place that will make it a lot easier for you. So maybe in the future, yeah, let's, uh, we, can, we can revisit this uh, subject, it would be fun. Oh, yeah, definitely, because I watched one of your past interviews, and you use this example of a credit card and making it thin line and then just doing a whole jumping ah. motion over it. I'm like, dude, like I've never heard it explained that way so well. I'm like, dude. <laughs> well, like I say, making money is really a lot to do with our choices. And the thing that's, I think, been astonishing to me, because I was not raised in a wealthy family, my father worked in construction. My mom babysat kids in the home. And I actually recently had a discussion with my parents and I found out at one point my dad had four jobs at the same time just to make ends meet. So we were broke, right? We were super broke. And up until my high school years, even including mostly I wore hand-me-downs that came from one of my uncles. And of course he was bigger than me. So I looked kind of awkward, right? That was my high school. But it, it, it's something that once you understand how money is made, how money arrives, it comes a lot easier, right? And so, yeah, we could certainly have that discussion. Woohoo! Stay tuned for part two, folks. Stay tuned for part two. Love to do it. That's, that's right. The debonair dashing dog, baby. That's right. <laughs> well, all right. I'm coming down to the question that everybody gets to receive around one, and that is if you were to wake up tomorrow and you were 25 again, but this time in the year of 2020, with all of your amassed knowledge and experience and no pandemic, what advice would you give to yourself? Well, wow, that's kind of a neat question. I think probably the advice that I would give is to start my interviews with the top achievers a lot earlier than I did and to go out and build a vast network. You know, right now, it's interesting. I see a lot of the gurus out there talking about a high income skill. Go get a high income skill or a high value skill. And without fail, most of them are saying that it's sales. And um, I think that's totally wrong. <laughs> it's not sales. We're not here to sell each other. Sales and transactional relationships, notice I said transactional, not transformational, are very short-term immediate gratification. You make a sale and you can then move on, right? <laughs> that relationship doesn't stick. The highest value skill that you could possibly learn is how to create and maintain high-level relationships. That's going to change your life faster than anything else. You know, the people that are in your Rolodex, are the ones that bring you your opportunities. They're the one that bring you your support. They're the ones that bring you your mentorship, your education. Everything comes from your network, 
right? Even those sales, they come from your network. You can't make a sale without another person on the other end. And so my advice to anyone even listening is you need to learn how to build those high level connections and networks. And so, um, you know, if, if you're interested to do that, I love that you keep talking about some of the YouTube videos we put up. The thing you didn't mention is all that stuff is free. So if you like this and you want to learn, yeah, you want to learn more about, you know, how to build these networks, come follow me on YouTube. I got great videos that I'm posting and I've got lots of free tools that are out there to teach you how to level up your networks. And, you know, people want to know, how did I gain access to the 400 top achievers? Uh, here's another question. How did I get past the gatekeeper for some of these people, right? Like you don't get to Oprah Winfrey by just simply, you know, showing up in Chicago and there she is ready to talk to you. No, you got to sometimes find your way through. And so um, how did I do that? And I'd love to teach you guys those kind of things if you're interested to learn. Like I said, start the journey. Head over to our YouTube channel. You can join me on Insta. You can find me on Facebook. We got lots of free tools. And if you dig what we are sharing, join us because we got lots of really great stuff. And I host events all the time, by the way, where I bring these top achievers out too. So if you want to come out and visit with us, I've got an event coming up where we've got one of the co-founders of Ted Baker, the founder of Ugg Boots. I've got Academy Award winners that are coming out, one of the former CEOs of Nike and Reebok. I've got the girl that did the marketing for all of Uber and Purina and companies like that. And as you know from our films, we've got thought leaders come out. In fact, I've had at all, all those guys you see, John Martini and Bob Doyle and Bob Proctor and Marie Diamond, they've all come out to my events. So we've got some really interesting people. But if you want to come start like rolling at a higher circle, like, come, come hang out with us. The invitation is here. We'd love to have you. And uh, lots of fun stuff. And as you can imagine, you know, I mean, when you start meeting these people and you start hanging out with them, that's cool. But it gets even cooler when they start wanting to joint venture with you and partner with you and working on some of the projects that you're doing and supporting you and writing letters of endorsements and introducing you to their friends. And the list goes on. But your network is your number one thing. It always will be. Right? It's kind of like that Russian proverb, it's better to have 100 friends than 10,000 rubles, right? That's what you want. You want your friends to open doors for you. And by the way, that note on sales that I was just talking about, if you're going to a networking event looking to sell to somebody, man, you're doing it wrong. Go to a networking event and look for the person who has all your customers already and do a deal with them. Don't go looking for somebody to sell to. Look for the influencer who's got your customers and you'll find that you'll scale so much quicker it's just easier that way. Well, that's what I call true next level thinking. <laughs> that's well, yeah. Well, you, you, you know, one of my mentors said it this way. He says, beginning entrepreneurs and broke entrepreneurs ask, what can I do? Notice the question starts with what? And they say, how do I do it? That's a how question. Well, top level entrepreneurs never ask what or how questions. They always ask who. <laughs> who do I need to connect with? Who can answer this for me? Who has my customers? Who can help me? Who can build this? Who can do that? You, you never, like any time that you're asking questions saying what I or how I or how can I, whatever, you're attaching you to it. And any time that you're a cog in the wheel, you're a clog in the wheel. And so you want to know why you're broke? It's probably because you're doing too much work. And I know that sounds contradictory, but the wealthiest people actually find other people who are better than them to do the work. And they orchestrate it. They're better managers. They're leaders. They're the ones who are steering the ship rather than the one at the oar, right? Like you see those movies where the slaves are at the oar. Well, most business owners want to be at the oar. Don't be that. <laughs> Steer the ship. Don't be paddling it along. That's ridiculous. But anyway, so I hope that helps somebody out there. Hey, that is gold right there. <laughs> you can't steer and paddle. <laughs> No, you can't. And you know what? If you're paddling, tomorrow's a new day. Drop the paddle. Start, start doing it differently. In fact, it's kind of interesting. I'm working on a new book right now. You guys have heard of things like the four hour work week and all that kind of stuff. Great book, by the way. But I think that's too much work. I really do. If you want to become wealthy, um, I do most of my work. I, I'm working on a book right now called the six minute work day. Oh, wow. And for my companies, I, I'm right now doing about eight figures in passive income. Uh, every year. So in other words, it's not attached to a job. It's not attached to time. But what I do have to do, and let's get the proper understanding of passive income, is there are things that you have to manage and there are things that you've got to lead out on and training that you need to do and so forth. But that can actually be done in about six minutes a day once it's set up, right? Like once it's set up. So yeah, who knows? Like I said, we'll come back. We'll talk about that if you want. Happy to do it. Sounds like a fun conversation. Sounds like a conversation on steroids too. My goodness, six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
And, and again, you'd be surprised what you can do in six minutes if you get focused, right? <laughs> oh, wow. Six, six pack abs metaphorically in six minutes. Gotta love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Woo. Well, definitely going to put all of your stuff in the show notes. Definitely reach out. Check out his YouTube channel as well as his name, which is the one and only Doug Vemarine. Yes, indeed. Did I pronounce that correctly the second time? Vermeeran, but that's all, it's all good, right? I'm not the important one, you guys are. And so just uh, as long as they can look up the name to find the, fr the free tools and the free support, I'm happy with that. Woohoo! Definitely check out his wonderful stuff indeed. Definitely check out his wonderful stuff. My man's completed a whole dress full of gems tonight with this wisdom. That's what I'm talking about right there. So well, any part of fun. <laughs> <laughs> we had fun. That's right. Fun on the magical bun. So any parting words to the folks still listening, Doug? Just be brilliant. Just dial into your best self. Don't settle for less. You know, again, you, you go around this world once. And uh, I think it's really important that every day you give your best and you find what's going to make you happy and fulfilled that allows you to have as, as many freedoms and choices as you can. Be brilliant. Recognize that you're brilliant and trust in that. That's so important. You just got done listening to another powerful, power-packed episode of the Going North Podcast. I hope you really enjoyed what you heard. You made it all the way to the end. You get to hear all sorts of goodness. I was the best, but you just got done hearing some goodness. Go check out the guest stuff. It's all in the show notes on the website, dombreiben.com. And also reach out to those that you've just heard as well. And keep rocking it. Because you, yourself, are phenomenal for making it this far. And keep going north.